Before I get started, I want to address the elephant that may or may not be in the room. And the reason why I say it that way is that just last week I was interviewed by Todd Jeffries of KLBJ to help promote what's happening here with the Small Business Festival in Austin and also other cities around the nation, which is awesome work, by the way, for the Small Business Festival, guys. Way to go. <clears throat> and during that interview, he asked me a question that I often get asked, but he didn't ask it in this way. He said, with a name like Don Osmond, shouldn't you be in entertainment? Oh, I've got slides too. We'll skip that one right there. Shouldn't you be in entertainment? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, yeah, I guess I could be. That is part of the family business. But more importantly, I actually did go into the family business, not necessarily from my paternal side, but more from my maternal side. And I'll explain. The Small Business Festival really is about celebrating the entrepreneur. And that's what we're all here doing. We're being entrepreneurial. My great-great-grandfather was an entrepreneur around about the time when some really cool new disruptive technology was coming out. It was called the automobile. Oh, I think you've already heard of it before, right? Driven one before? Not here in Austin, right? It's too much traffic. Well, he thought it was pretty cool. And in the thriving metropolis of La Grande, Oregon, he said, I want to get in on this technology. Uh, he probably didn't say it that way. He probably said, that's a cool car. <laughs> I don't know. It was nearly 100 years ago. So he started a business. He started a garage where he started selling cars. And as any good entrepreneur, he got his business organized. He hired some people. He bought inventory. And then the most important thing, of course, from my perspective, is he started marketing it, started telling people about his business. Unfortunately, he didn't get onto Facebook and Twitter. Those took a few more years to get around. So what did he do? He started with direct mail pieces. Because at about early 1900, I mean, TV was probably getting there, radio was kind of getting there, but really the best way he could go about telling about his business was either talking to people or sending them a direct mail piece. Now, interestingly enough, I have one of the oldest pieces of junk mail in the world right here. And I didn't bring it with me because it's too important to me. This right here cost him probably a, maybe a little more than a penny to design, to print, and to, distrib uh, to distribute, to send it out in the mail. So his whole marketing budget was probably what? $3? Not much has changed in 100 years, has it? Right? <laughs> what I love about this is the honesty in the message that he's sharing. Right there down at the bottom it says, United States tires are good tires. Didn't need any other cool adjectives to describe it other than just, hey, these are good tires. Today we have a little bit more of a challenge. We have so many choices on how to market our companies, so many choices on how to communicate with our audiences and with our customers and clients that we have a challenge placed before us. The, uh, there's, a, there's a TED Talk uh, done by a guy by the name of Barry Schwartz, and he wrote a book called The Paradox of Choice. His presentation is kind of a little negative because he explains how by having more choices and more opportunities, we should have expected that we have a, a, a happier life, a more fulfilled life, or we have better freedoms and opportunities. But he said what ends up happening is we paralyze our, our decision-making process. The whole point of what I'm going to be talking about today is about the human mind and talking about a 15,000-year-old marketing strategy and why it works and why that marketing strategy not, not, 
isn't not necessarily, was that a double negative? May have been. It's not necessarily social media, although that's a tactic. It may not be word of mouth marketing, although that's important, and getting reviews and getting people to compliment you about what you do on your business. But more importantly, it's about how do we go about going through that process. So here's what typically happens with us as entrepreneurs. We, we have all these choices. We can advertise on television, radio. We can go through the traditional marketing routes. We can go through social media. We can create websites. We can do all these different types of things, but we're limited with the scope of time and resources, i.e. money, especially as entrepreneurs. Scrappy entrepreneurs getting out there and doing what we love doing. So we end up having two thoughts, which I've coined them as uh, either no thanks or to the banks, which basically means no thanks, I'm going to do it my own. I'm going to go through word of mouth marketing. I'm going to talk to people and tell them about my business and do that. I can do that. I've got social media. Or there are so many different avenues that I'm afraid to miss out on one opportunity that I'm going to go to every single opportunity I possibly can regardless of what my budget may or may not be able to withhold. This poses a real big challenge for us as entrepreneurs. What do we do? What, what's the, where do we go from here? What are we supposed to do? If we have so many choices and we're afraid to make those choices, whether that, that fear puts us into a position where we say, I'm not going to make any choices and just do it on my own, or that that fear of having too many choices makes us think I've got to do every single one of them. Both of those are bad scenarios. There's a great quote by the character Dr. Ian Malcolm. Now, I don't know if any of you are movie buffs here, but Dr. Ian Malcolm made a statement, and I won't tell you the movie yet. I'm going to give you what he said first see if you can figure it out. He said, your scientists were so preoccupied thinking about whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think whether or not they should. Anybody know the movie by now? What movie is it? Jurassic Park. Yes, exactly. Of course, we all know how that story ends. Spoiler alert. Dinosaurs overrule the, the, the park, the island, and everybody has to leave for their lives. There's an eerie similarity between that movie and referencing dinosaurs and making the comparison to marketing, <laughs> right? We're so preoccupied thinking about whether or not we can do something. We can get on social media. We can go on television. We can do radio. We can network, whatever. But we don't stop to think whether or not we should. So what's the resolve? I mean, what are we supposed to do? We've got all these options, we have to market, it's important. What are we supposed to do? Well, marketing really is supposed to do three things. It's supposed to, it is supposed to be memorable, it's supposed to be meaningful, and it's supposed to create movement. What's interesting about this, and there's been a little bit of a buzz in the marketing world, talking about these kind of topics as well, is that stories do the exact same thing. Stories are memorable. They're easy to remember because we think in sequential order. Stories are also very powerful because they give us meaning. They, they approach us on an emotional level. And stories, interestingly enough, whether we want them to or not, the DNA inside of a story actually moves us to want to be like somebody, do something, or go out and be a part of something. I mean, if you've ever watched an action movie, and I'm, I'm probably speaking more to the men than I am the women, although I don't want to be gender biased here in any way, form, or shape. If you go and watch an action movie, you kind of feel like, oh man, that car chase was awesome. I could be driving that car right now. And then we try it in the middle of Austin traffic and we get stuck on I-35 and not doing any more than about two or three miles an hour. <clears throat> so stories do this. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So how do we take this concept of storytelling and participate that in part of our marketing? Well, that, that is the trick. That really is the, the crux of marketing. Marketing's not, it's not the tactics, it's actually the message. So let's go back in time for a second because I haven't gone much further back than about 100 years so far. According to some scientists and some theorists, storytelling has probably existed for about 15,000 years. Whether or not you believe that, disbelieve that, or whatever, we can probably all safely say stories have been existing for a very long time. In fact, some of the oldest books are actually a compilation of a lot of different stories. And forgive me for mixing church and state here for a second, but let's take a look at the Bible for just a quick minute. Whether you believe in it or not, we could all probably safely say that there are stories in there, and it's caused people to follow a certain belief structure or be moved in a certain way. And that's exactly what it's done. So from a marketer's perspective, the Bible is the ultimate marketing tool, right? <laughs> it's a fabulous story to some. I'm not saying to everybody. I'm sure there are other people that have other beliefs and things like that, but I'm using it as an example. So why is it that we do this? Why is it that we communicate through story, or at least we connect, I should say. We communicate through a lot of different means, but we connect more meaningful through story. Well, according to some scientists, and I had the opportunity of actually sitting on a panel in South by Southwest just a little while ago with a neuroscientist who explained to me, and I am not a scientist, so forgive me about this, okay? I'm just going to kind of reiterate some of these points. You can go out and Google all this and figure it out for yourself, but for the most part, there are chemicals that are released in our mind through our body. Uh, I don't know, what are they, dopamine, uh, what are they? Thank you, that's another one, yes. So there's all these different chemical releases in our body that do these different types of things. And according to these scientists and the studies that have been done, they affect us and our social behavior, they affect us on our emotional levels, they help us to re uh, for cognitive uh, abilities, to be able to recall and remember different types of things. And our minds, are, the human mind has evolved over these thousands of years. We can all safely say the, that the world's at least 2,000 years old, right? According to our calendar, it's at least 2,000, maybe six, maybe 15, could be a few hundred million. It's, it's a long time, right? So our mind has become accustomed to this process of telling a story to be able to understand stories and to think and to relate through a story. <clears throat> I'll skip over this one here. There are, again, according to some, a few different types of basic archetypes of stories. What's interesting about the story, any story for that matter, is that they're unique. They may follow a specific pattern, but they're unique to the person who's had the experience because of the perceptions that we've had in life. But there are roughly about seven archetypes, and the reason why is so that we can kind of relate to it and go, oh yeah, that's, that story right there, that's a, that's a tragedy. Or another story, now that is absolutely hilarious, that's more of a comedy. Marketers, Really good marketers have been doing this for years. <clears throat> and we've probably not even noticed it. Speaking of tragedies, let's take a look at any commercial out there by most lawyers or ambulance chasers. Any lawyers in the... I, I should... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> have you been in an accident? Have you been in a tragedy? They want to hear your story to move you emotionally to get you to buy I mean, there's a, a whole slew of them. Have you ever seen a um, Have you ever seen a cosmetic commercial or a makeup commercial? There's a rebirth, recognizing one's youth, reliving one's youth. What else do we have up there? Overcoming the monster. That one's an interesting one. Nike. Nike's an iconic use of 
marketing experiences, especially their tagline with just do it. Overcoming the monster, just do it. It's empowering, causes us to move. It's easy to be, remember, be remembered. It's easy to tell a story around those types of things and we just want to participate in it. It causes us to move. <clears throat> All right, why baked beans? When I was really, really little, learning how to read, we used to make trips to grandma's house. And it was a long drive, it took us about 12 hours to get there, and I always loved going to grandma's house. Because every time we got there, at the end of that trip, she always had a meal ready for us. It wasn't anything extravagant. Baked beans, bread and butter, pickles and olives, and maybe a little juice box. To a kid that's about five, six years old, that's a feast for a king, especially after a 12-hour ride in a car. So I loved it. Well, one, t one trip that we made out to, to Grandma's house, I remember sitting in the kitchen with her, and I had just started learning how to read. And I watched her prepare the meal, and I noticed the can, and I recognized a word on that can. And I said, those are the beans that say van on them, which means nothing to anybody in this room, I'll tell you right now. But I'll tell you, the name of the company is called Van Camp Baked Beans. Well, my grandmother thought that was so cute that every time we'd go over to her house, she would always ask, do you want the beans that say van on them? Little did I know at the time, obviously I was just little, and I think she didn't probably didn't recognize us either, but we created our own little story associated to a brand. Therefore, for the next 20 years, my grandmother only bought one kind of baked beans, Van Camp baked beans. This is what we try to do as marketers, is we try to actually attach a story, a personal story. Now, obviously, Van Camp can't do that. They say, hey, Don Osmond's grandma bought baked beans for 20 years because they're the beans that say Van on them. It's not going to work. But we do try to tell these types of stories, which is why we think of stories in the most broadest of sense to actually captivate our niche market. So how do we do that? With the time that I have left here, let me explain. How do we go about figuring out our stories? It is extremely painful and very difficult. Okay, now that I've completely discouraged you, let me tell you how you do it. Ask yourself the question, why did I start my business? Why am I in business? And once you've answered that question, pretend you're three years old and ask yourself, why? Yeah, but why? And after you answered that question, pretend you're three years old again and say, yeah, but why? If you can remember reliving those experiences as a youth or even as an adult with a child, mommy, can I have some candy? No, why? Because I said so, no, why? Go through that a few times. You'll actually dig deep and find the, that meaning at the, at the core level as to why you started your business. And you'll find something there. Once you've found that out, Go out and do a little bit of searching from your customers and ask them, why do you like working with me? Why do you like my business? What is it? And from those two perspectives, you are going to find a story, a generalized story that actually targets that market. Use that. And if you can't figure out how to do that, work with somebody who does know how to do that. Find somebody who can help you find that story and articulate that story. Then go off into social media, then go off and build your website, and then go off and do all those other tactical pieces, and you'll have something that will resonate with the, with the audiences that you work with. Approach it from that, that standpoint. Don't be like Jurassic Park and do everything you can and not realize what you should have done. You might lose your park. Okay, that's a little dramatic. Let me leave you with this, and since I I don't have a lot of things memorized. And I just barely found this. It's a, uh, it's a poem by a Victorian London Irish poet, Arthur Shaughnessy. I hope I said his name right. Again, somebody way back in like the 1800s wrote this. And I loved it 
because I think it resonates and targets the heart of, all entre- of, of the entrepreneurial spirit in each one of us in this room. It says this, we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams, yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. You started your business for a reason. Your goal in marketing should be able, should be to articulate that reason. We are the movers and shakers. We are the dreamers of dreams. Go out, find your story, and when you've found it, tell everybody about it. Thank you very much.